let's look at some of the basics of mechanisms. Yes, of course, organic chemistry so will involve um, some kind of chemical reactions where we will have some new products formed. Um, but to form new products, of course, so some bonds have to be broken. Okay, so the bonds of the reactants will have to be broken so that new products can be made. And there are two types of fission, so fission meaning bonds breaking. And this is exactly actually exactly what the mechanisms show. They show the bond breaking and the bond making of organic molecules. And there is a curly arrow that shows this movement. Yes, the movement of a pair of electrons. And there is always a reason of the movement of these electrons. But there are two types of fission. One we will encounter it a lot more often, the other one a bit less. And homolytic fission, well, homo means same. And that's why it's the, the even breaking of a covalent bond. It forms radical. But if you think about a radical, it's nothing else than the element itself. Because elements, they have a lone pair of electrons. So taking a little bit, think about chlorine. Chlorine is in group seven, so it has seven electrons in the outer shell, just as an element, not when it's bonded. So guess what it is? Well, it has a lone, a lone electron. But that's what makes an element so reactive. That technically an element, it's a, actually a radical. But a radical, it's a species that it's formed during a chemical reaction. Okay. Mm -hmm. But... This uh, homolytic fission is uh, shown by the movement of a half hour in this case, because uh, the um, the electrons that are represented by those oops, that are represented by the lines, so this covalent bond, uh, they move, yeah, one on each side, yeah, mm -hmm. one on each atom, leaving behind carbon with one radical and the carbon with one radical in this case. Okay, so it's a half hour because it shows the movement of just one electron. The heterolytic fission is the uneven breaking of a covalent bond. And this will cause the formation of ions. But let's try to understand the ions in terms of uh, um, movement of electrons. So if you think about the covalent bond, it's made of two electrons. So we have one dot and one cross. One comes from the chlorine and one comes from the carbon. For example, let's do it kind of dot and cross diagram. So let's say that the carbon has those uh, crosses and the chlorine, like up here, it has these dots. Okay. So if yeah. both electrons move on one side, guess what happens to the chlorine? Well, it has the seven electrons that it had before. Yeah. Because that's, well, it shares just one. So that's uh, still in the chlorine. But in addition, the other electron, so from the carbon, has moved on to the chlorine. So this is what gives that just negative charge. And that's something that sometimes it, it feels like a bit confusing. Like, wait, if two electrons are moving, why then is just minus one or plus one? Well, because the, the those uh, atoms already contribute to one electron in the bond. So basically they take either one extra or lose just one of these electrons. And it's called heterolytic simply because it's hetero, so different. They break differently. In fact, they form those um, those charges. So that's the bond fission, homolytic, and the heterolytic. Heterolytic is a lot more common. Homolytic, we would just see one mechanism, which is uh, the um, radical substitution of alkanes. Let's link now the, the this fission that we talked about with one reaction, one of these reactions that we need to know, which is the free radical substitution. So first of all, the free radical substitution, it involves radical and involves a substitution reaction. So here I would point out to look at the um at the overall equation to understand why it's a substitution. CH4 plus Cl2 gives CH3Cl plus HCl. So the change that has occurred, so we need to always look at the change to understand the type of reaction that has taken place, is that one hydrogen of the CH4 has been replaced by one chlorine, and that's substitution. So substitution reaction. But how did this substitution occur? Or better, what has substituted in? Well, a radical. And this is to do with one particular property of halogens. That is when they're exposed to UV light, homolytic fission occurs, and this forms radicals. In fact, this is the first step called initiation. The chlorine splits to form 
to chlorine radicals. If we think in terms of um, mechanism, we would have the chlorine bonded to another chlorine. Remember that the line means that there are two electrons is a covalent bond and each electron moves to each chlorine forming two of these chlorine radicals. Remember with the little dot to show that it has an unpaired electron. So this is the initiation, homolytic fission. The second step is propagation. And propagation is the reaction between a radical and a non-radical to form another radical. Um, there is always the common steps. The first is that the radical forms a new bond with hydrogen. So chlorine will always react with hydrogen to form HCl and leaves a carbon radical. As you can see, the carbon is radical. Let's look at what the mechanism looks like. So we have a CH. This is the bond that we care about in terms of mechanism. And we have a chlorine radical. This is what happens. So the chlorine will form a new bond with the hydrogen. So those two electrons come together so that one electron from the hydrogen will bond with one electron of the chlorine to form that new bond, HCl. And this electron is left alone onto the carbon. And that's where we get that CH3 radical. Okay, we can write it in different ways. I mean, as long as we show that the radical is on the carbon, so like this or CH3 radical. So either way is absolutely correct. It just shows a bit better how, where the hydrogens are bonded and where, where the radical is because it's always on the carbon. The second step, the carbon radical reacts with the halogen molecule to reform the halogen radical. In fact, it behaves as a catalyst because notice that it's used up in the first step but it's reformed in the second step. And that's actually the definition of a catalyst. While the carbon radical actually in the, this type of mechanism, it's called an intermediate because it's, it's formed and then it reacts straight after. In fact, notice what happens. The CH3 reacts with the chlorine to form this new bond and the, the mechanism is really similar. So we have uh, these uh, CH3 radical and then uh, we have... Uh, the chlorine, those two electrons come together to form a new bond, which would be that CH3Cl, and then the other electron is left alone to the chlorine, forming, reforming the radical and the desired product. No, that should be a radical. And the desired product. The termination step, which is the third one, uh, is the cleavage of two radicals, or better, two radicals reacted together and they stop reacting because they formed a new bond. And it's when those two electrons would come together to form a bond. And in this case, we're looking at the desired product. Okay, so initiation, propagation, termination. All of the steps, they're continuously occurring because radicals, they're extremely reactive. That's really the issue with it. They're so reactive that they can pretty much react with anything that is present in the solution. So propagation could occur, but at the same time, some termination could occur, okay? So the problem with this mechanism is that the radicals are highly reactive species. Side reactions take place to form a mixture of products or even further substitution. Let's analyze each of it. The first one, it's a termination step because as you can see, two radicals reacted together. But it's not the termination that we wanted, which was uh, of course forming the monosubstituted haloalkane by reforming an, uh, for another alkane. So that's a side product. It's a side reaction taking place. Or this is actually just a propagation. So let's do P for propagation, T for termination of these side reactions. As this a propagation, notice that we have exactly the same steps. In fact, it's useful to remember the propagation like that because then it doesn't matter which molecule you have. It doesn't matter how many substitutions you need to show because it's always the same steps. As we said before, the first step was the chlorine radical steals one of the hydrogens, leaving behind the carbon radical. There we go. In fact, in the first step, HCl is always formed, and then it leaves behind the radical, and of course, this haloalkane with a hydrogen less. Then the intermediate formed, this carbon radical, reacts with the chlorine molecule to form the desired product and reform the catalyst. 
So in every propagation step, we have the HCl in the first and the chlorine radical in the second. Knowing this can help us identifying a bit which what else it's formed, because it can be confusing with for example, a mistake that I see often is that in the first step, you would add straight away the, the chlorine, but then you would have more than one chlorine. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You would need to balance the equation and that wouldn't be correct. There wouldn't be the movement of the radical. So it's really important to um, give logic to all of these steps. For example, if we have to show further propagation, let's say that we have these CH2, Cl2, and let's do another propagation step of, of a further substitution. It reacts with a chlorine radical. I know always that the first step is that HCl is formed. Okay, if HCl is formed, where did this H was taken from? The hydroalkane. Therefore, we would have a CHCl2. So like that, the elements make sense that they're balanced. We we fully understand the movement of the uh, of of, of atoms in this reaction. But then of course we know it's a propagation. So we need to think where is the radical gone? It's not really gone anywhere. It's just the I mean, it is the carbon that was left behind as a radical. Yeah. What else? Then we have this intermediate, which we know would react straight after, but we need to remember what does it react with? Well, with a chlorine atom like that we would have the desired product with one extra chlorine because we also need to keep in mind like, okay, so what do I really want to do in this reaction? In this case, is the substitution. Also because we reform these chlorine radicals. So we can think it like that, that the chlorine radical is formed. So what is left behind? Well, one extra chlorine will be added onto the hydroalkane. Yeah, so we can always bring a bit of logic into those steps or just trying to remember, okay, what are the common things that always occur in the propagation? Okay, but the the point uh, is that uh, those reactions, there are so many sad reactions that take place. I mean, every single species present can react with everything else that is present because radicals, they're really, really reactive and they're really difficult to, to control. So we could have a lot of side reaction. Therefore, this is not really considered one of the one of the best method to actually uh, make halo alkanes from uh, from alkenes. alkanes. <laughs> So in this work, in this example, um, on this exercise, almost, uh, um, almost perfect. Termination, the propagation mm, doesn't matter like where we start. I mean, of course, first it's useful to understand what's the molecule that we're talking about. In this case, it was trichloropropane, but uh, it doesn't matter how difficult it is, as long as we just focus on the things that we know, like. I know that the first step of propagation, so those two, it will be HCl. In the second, the chlorine radical is reformed. I think this is what always can um, can simplify a bit the, the steps if we have a bit more complex molecule to start with. And determination, yeah, really good with, uh, well, it's just, we need to think, okay, what is the useful product? Yeah, because in this case, it was the second substitution. So we are really specific for that. Um, to be picky, we could, uh, instead of writing the radical on the chlorine here, which would, may seem that it's the chlorine that has a radical on the CH3, C3H6Cl, we could write it instead uh, on uh, the carbon. So we can be picky and do that just to make it a bit more representative. Alternatively, if you write the uh, structure of formula, we would write it like this. The, the radical exactly on I mean here there would there wouldn't be an hydrogen but it would look like this the chlor the radical is actually on that carbon even if it's in the middle of the chain so that's the only thing we can always be picky on uh, we can always be picky on um, where the radical is because uh, we want to follow as we write the mechanism we want to follow it with logic so it has to be logical for uh, for you as well that's why it's I think it's useful to write it where the radical actually is just to make it more 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 correct yeah but good